Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome back, everybody. We're about to hear a very special interview with uh, um, the author of It's Your Funeral, Thomas P.J. Crean, or as many of us know him, Tom Crean. Tom is, is a funeral director, and what makes Tom special in that role is that he really does give a crap about people. He isn't one of the, those that, that's that been hidden away in some place, embalming place or something like that, that, that doesn't want to get involved. I actually met Tom th- for the first time while working with Surrey Hospice, and I immediately got grew, grew to like him because he really cared about the community. He wanted to make sure that People could afford to have services in our community. He wanted to make sure that people could live well. Yeah, he's in the business of what happens after we pass on. But he wants to make sure that people can live well before they get to that point. He wants to make sure that when you come to see him with your loved one, that he is going to do his best honor your loved one and to make sure that that this painful process of letting go of a person is an I can't exactly say an easy one but a doable one he becomes that guide that will help you get through the clouds because he works a certain hospice he also has access to grief counselors and he he'll refer you to to people that to to actually help you get through what is one of the most difficult things that we ever do as human beings and that is to say goodbye to someone who has passed on now his book it's your funeral is about how corporate greed tried to creep into his profession and how he pushed back against it. He's re-releasing the book, It's Your Funeral, because of one of his best friends in Mississippi has recently had a movie made about their plight against pushing back corporate greed. And that movie is The Burial with Tommy Lee Jones and in the starring role as um, Jeremiah O'Keefe and he wants he he wants to honor that movie by redoing the book and getting it back out there again so that everybody can know what really is happening with corporate greed and how 
this movie, The Burial, and his book speak out against the corporate monsters that try to rule our lives and try to take away our dreams. And at times, they try to take away the dignity of death of our loved ones. So why don't we listen to what Tom actually has to say uh, in this our next conversation. So, Tom, why did you write the book? It's your it's your funeral. Well, to be candid, Michael, um, I arrived in funeral service quite suddenly when my uncle, who was only 52, dropped dead, and there was nobody to carry on the family business. And we were serving, like, the, the year he died... 1975 we served 60 families was barely enough to keep the doors open so i was in my fourth year of philosophy at ubc and um just quit school cold turkey to take over the family business and was astonished to find that all these family businesses that my family had been competing with for uh, by that time, almost 70 years, um, were all being bought out by these nameless conglomerates. And these conglomerates would charge way more money and cut back half their staff and provide half the service. So all of a sudden, I discovered that in order to survive, I had to draw a distinction between publicly traded funeral companies and family funeral homes. And so I wrote the book as an explanation of why there's really no place in my mind for public companies in funeral service. Yeah, it, it just feeds into that that large um, cauldron of corporate greed that needs to, needs to find some limits. <laughs> No. Um, so why why uh, why re-release the book? Um, it, it, in this uh, past month, you just re-released the book. So why did you why why the re-release? Well, I think that the book is a very important conte- contextual support for the great film that Amazon is bringing out called The Burial. The uh, Amazon film shows the unlikely partnership between my buddy Jeremiah O'Keefe and the very sassy, provocative, but successful um, Afro-American lawyer that he hired out of Florida to take the Lowen group to task for the way they were treating his Mississippi uh, uh, clientele. Mm. To, um so uh, 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 were they were they doing the same thing in in um in Mississippi that that you described here in Vancouver um low uh raise the prices and and provide less service Exactly right Being a public company isn't cheap <laughs> No that is very true but uh but being a public company can also bring uh especially to the the um the chief executive officer and the board of directors uh large paychecks well i went to the low and bankruptcy in wilmington delaware and i'd get out of my taxi from the holiday inn and then behind me the limousine would pull up and all the bankruptcy executive from the Lowen group would pour out of their limousines. They weren't taking much time to 
save money for their shareholders. <laughs> I, I like that. They 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 they, uh, they they poured out of their limousines. They it's not like they they drove up and say a a, a Toyota Carcel or something like that, right? <laughs> no. Nope. <laughs> so. You're, you're, you you're kind of reminding me of um the the uh auto industry with the when when all of the the uh the big names in 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 the auto industry sh- showed up in Washington to ask for bailout money and they all climbed out of their out of, out of their lear jets in Washington <laughs> to ask for bailout money because they were going poor but they could fly a Learjet, right? Yeah, so, no kidding. So it, it 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 is the same pattern of of corporate greed. Yeah, and disrespect for the shareholder. Yeah. So, um, with that with that being said, uh, you appeared in in Ottawa, um, to uh, in you successfully pushed back against uh, some of the the corporate happenings in Canada with the home funeral, uh, with the family-owned funeral home industry, right? Yeah, we opposed the biggest funeral conglomerate, Service Corporation International out of Houston, Texas, trademarking in both Canada and the United States the phrase family funeral care. And we were successful in defeating them in uh, Ottawa. We pointed out that these companies were the opposite of family funeral care. And then when we won that trademark battle in April of uh, 2003, um, I sent that news release to 18 independent groups in the United States that I'd been working with. Mm -hmm. And none of them had supported my trademark opposition to speak of in the U.S., Mm -hmm. Um, but the day they saw that Canada beat SCI, (laughs) they all joined. So we had thousands of funeral homes by the time it went to court in uh, Washington, D.C., and we beat the, we beat Service Corporation in Washington as well in 70, in uh, 2007. Yeah. We Canadians embarrassed our American peers into standing up for themselves. Well, um, on a different note, though, a lot of people are afraid to to, to push back against the corporations. So they think something bad is going to happen to them, don't they? Well, exactly, and that's, I think, why there's such a reign of terror pervade upon the people by Wall Street, because they think that their economic force makes them more right than we the people, but that fails to take into account what really built these countries, which was we, the people. Exactly. Right. That exactly. Uh, that we, we, the people, we, we, we have a voice, uh, but we need to exercise that voice. Well, I have to tell you, Michael, that I've prayed a great deal in my struggles against wall street. Mm-hmm. And I've now had five battles with the billionaires and I've beaten them five times. And in truth, it was me praying my brains out and being told by my creator where to step each day. All my partners gave up on me during the campaign saying, Tom, if only you'd told us what you were doing, we could have supported you. But it was a journey of faith, Michael. I had no idea what I was doing. How could I tell anybody? I just prayed my brains out and every day was told where to step the next day. Mm Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, five battles with the billionaires and beat them five times. And all of that was due to prayer. Yeah. I'm not this smart. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we, we had to we had to submit to the to to that higher power, right? Well, and not only that, a true journey of faith is incredibly exciting. It's really, really exciting to have no idea where you're going. Mm. So what what do you want to see for um for for the f- the funeral industry to, um overall 
Well, first of all, I don't consider us an industry. Wall Street does, but I consider us a profession. Mm -hmm. And as such, I think it's vital that people know whether they're dealing with a public company conglomerate or they're dealing with a local family funeral home. We local family funeral homes don't have any assets besides the credibility of our name. Mm -hmm. So if we don't serve our community, we don't exist. Whereas the public companies, all they've got is a stock average. And so if they're not making profit each day, they don't exist. And that's what I'm saying is that there's no place at all for that kind of a business model in caring for grieving citizens who just couldn't possibly be any more vulnerable. Well, the loss of a, of a loved one, it doesn't matter if, if it's if it's mom, dad, wife, husband, child, it's a, it's all, all, all emotionally the same that, you know, you, you're cut down at your knees, right? Yep. And the last thing you need is, is, is some funeral d director, um, who is money grubbing and just kicks you in and just kicks you in the gut on top of that. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and and these Wall Street conglomerates, you know, think that they've won the lottery discovering that grieving clients are completely vulnerable. They, they go around buying these family funeral homes because a lot of them are downtown properties where the humble families that operate the funeral homes can never hope to make any kind of return in funeral service that justify the millions of dollars in land that they've got invested and tied up. So really, these big funeral conglomerates are in the real estate business. They're not in funeral service. That's my opinion. Well, what does it mean to be in funeral service? What does it mean how you treat your client? Well, what, what it means is that somebody has a deep personal loss in their family and they come and they knock on your door and you help escort them through that deeply painful process, that deeply painful transition. But if all you're going to be judged by is the amount of sales you make from that person, basically caring for them and caring for yourself are mutually exclusive. Yeah. So, I heard I heard this as a story, and um, that a grieving son, his mo his mother died, and he wanted to honor her in 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 the best way possible. And he spent thousands of dollars for um, for for the casket. Um, and for her to 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 be laid out in, in a certain way and everything, and in the end, um, the 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 mother was 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 cremated, and he spent like I uh, say a couple of ten thousand dollars to uh, for for this particular funeral now again i know he wanted to honor his mother and expenses at that point you know it, you you're like uh how can i how can i put a limit to what i'm willing to pay to to honor my mother right but at the yeah. same time isn't there if you're on the other side of the counter collecting the money you're the one taking the fees didn't you put a limit to what you're going to charge well to me when i sit down with a family to arrange a funeral service i view it like i'm a artist a painter mm -hmm. and my palette of paints is the emotions of the family so what i'm trying to do is to paint the most complete portrait of the life of the deceased. And, and to me, a fundamental component of that is to discover what resources the family have to put towards the funeral. Mm -hmm. 
I've had people walk in the door of my funeral home telling me they want the most expensive casket in the world. Okay. That's not a family that I'm bending over backwards trying to save money for because they've got more money than, than they can spend. But to me, the average family coming in has a certain set of parameters which they can work within. So once I find out what the kind of parameters they have to work with, then I can start to make suggestions to get us close to achieving the most meaningful service as possible. And there's now, like when it comes to cremation, there's a number of areas that my profession has adapted itself to which help the families. For example, our most popular casket for cremation families is a rental casket where they have um, a wooden interior um, and then you, you put a beautiful wooden um, sort of a, it's almost like a, it's a covering really so that the public all sees this beautiful wooden casket. But what goes to the crematorium is a very simple, plain, uh, usually a particle board box. But nobody sees that because the casket's beautifully draped. And so there are ways that the profession is figuring out how to honor family's wishes without spending more money than is necessary. Yeah. But yeah. to me, the more complete that painting is, the more vital and the more value what I've provided has. And that makes sense. Um, that, that makes sense rather than, um, oh, how much can I soak, soak this family for um, to... Well, so from they, my point of view... Mm-hmm. My family, since 1908, my family has focused on getting the maximum amount of value out of the minimum amount of money, and that's why we're the only family funeral home left in the city of Vancouver. In mm -hmm. fact, at the 100th anniversary of the BC Funeral Association, it was also the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, Mm -hmm. Whoever the bizarre convention arranger was decided to serve us the same lunch at the 100th anniversary funeral convention as they served the families, uh, the passengers on the Titanic. I, I, I don't know who the convention organizer was. It seemed to me it was more of a horror production. Anyway, that evening at the dinner, all of these past presidents of the funeral association, most of whom I've embarrassed in the media because you know, everybody knows I don't lie to reporters to protect people that I think belong in prison. And uh, all of these past presidents who don't like me very much had to make room because my family was the only founding member of the BC Funeral Association still in business. That's a creative sense of humor. Uh, th that 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 is God's sense of humor on that one. <laughs> so that was a great day for the National Funeral Press. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I and I know that that uh, your family um, has a a property um, uh, not too far away from from our studio office um, he, he, here in Surrey, BC, right? Yeah. In uh, you, it, it's it's instilled in 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 everybody that works in uh, uh, in in that family business that um, value to to the client in honor of uh, in honoring the. Um, the the loved one that is lost, rather than we got to make a profit. Uh, absolutely. But to me, that portrait of the deceased—that's my signature. How do I engineer for that family the most meaningful farewell that's physically possible? Mm -hmm. And I mean, there, there's times when we've done services for free because the family had no resources. Um, 
that's not that often in Canada because the government has support for people that don't have resources. Um, but we've still done them. Yeah. We don't turn anyone away. Yeah. What does it mean to you to, to, to serve the community? It's, it's why I was born. My profession, like I, I, I just consider myself so unbelievably privileged to be given this profession. And I add to that that my profession for my entire working lifetime has been under threat from these external forces that are only profit driven. And um, so I, I just can't tell you how proud I am of 50 years of standing up against this monstrosity. I'm so proud of the contribution that I've been empowered to make. And again, I add, it's all a journey of faith because I'm not this smart. I've been gifted by prayer with exactly what to do to beat these companies five times in a row. Yeah. That, that's that's an amazing track record because there's um, I'm sorry that's an amazing track record and and it can't be done with, with without uh, with without without some some other power getting involved right <laughs> no question so and and the interesting thing about my past is that today as all our information systems are crumbling uh, like everybody and their brother thinks they're an activist um whereas i really am <laughs> i've been an activist because 50 years ago i learned that the people who ran big funeral service were a bunch of mafia goons yeah and you wrote the book to, uh, for, the, for that the reason book. it's your funeral yeah how grieving families are exploited and how to stop it well in in your opinion, what is what is the 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 best way that we can eliminate this the the, the shackles that, that that this corporate greed puts on us? Well, the the most important thing is that it's required by law that these conglomerates admit which companies they own, because what they do is they try to pretend they're the original owners. We call it stealth ownership. Mm-hmm. you got to ask who owns your funeral home is it some foreign conglomerate or is it your local family it's the most important question you can ask well yeah yeah I I, I see that because um, it's if your it, choice you can go and, yeah. and be personally cared for by people that are the same mindset as me or you can be part of the funeral factory well let's 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 go to add it this way right that um maybe in some cases uh um that you know um the guy comes it comes it comes in uh or or woman doesn't matter uh, they come in they come into into your business and they say hey Mom, dad, brother, sister has passed away, and I need to need, need I need help taking care of this. Right, the odds are if if the funeral home is family owned and exists in the community, that they know who the person is to begin with. Especially if it's the funeral home up the street from 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 where this person grew up all their life, right? Right. Doesn't that have an have an effect on on you have some sort of if you know if you if you've seen this person like go to the grocery store or something like that did you have somewhat of an emotional stake in that because you're part of that community then the corporate guy who the corporate own, uh, owned funeral home doesn't have that same stake does it? Well. A big part of the corporate presence mm-hmm. is 
to simulate the family presence. So when the corporation comes in and buys the funeral home, they try really hard to keep the original family working there. Mm-hmm. But the prices are still increased a great deal. I think the last comparative price list I saw was Vanity Fair magazine like 20 years ago. And on average, I think the average funeral you know, back then sold for 3500 And on average, the chains were $1,300 more expensive. Mm-hmm. So that's like 50%. Wow. So um, no matter who you're dealing with, you, you got to understand what kind of system you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. You may be still be talking to the original family owners, but they've got very little to do with how it's run anymore. Um, but in support of my family funeral homes, I need to say that at the peak of funeral consolidation, which was about the year 2000, Service Corp International had 5,200 funeral homes and cemeteries. The Lowen Group had 1,700, and Stewart Enterprises had 500. Those were the big three chains. Mm-hmm. Um, so of those 7,000 and uh, change funeral homes, the last time I looked, Service Corp International had bought Stewart and the Alderwoods Group, which was the name that Lowen emerged from bankruptcy with. And we're down to 1,200 funeral homes and cemeteries. So of all of the funeral homes and cemeteries that um, that uh, the three chains had bought from the family funeral homes, or in my lingo, of the all of the funeral homes Wall Street stole from the family funeral homes, we independents have clawed back seventy percent of them, and I, I defy any I defy any sector of the economy to show me that kind of performance in defending their communities. Now, most of my funeral home friends didn't do that by going out like I did, starting a family funeral home movement to educate the public that the difference. Most of them just woke up in the morning and did the right thing. But when you show up in small-town America or small-town Canada and all of a sudden the prices are doubled and half the staff are let go, the small towns figure it out. And they've sent those funeral homes packing. So I'm incredibly proud of the way that we family funeral homes have defended our communities, even though you're hard put to find you know, a single-family funeral home who knows that. Because uh, they just kept doing what they'd always done, which was the right thing. Yeah. So let me ask you this: In your opinion, you know, you successfully pushed back against five times um, against uh, large corporate ownership and everything. Um, in our times that we're seeing right now with the economy and the inflation being what it is, in your opinion, do you think that that we can push back and and successfully teach um, other uh, corporations and CEOs that, hey, we're not going to stand for them just raping our pockets and um, and we're not going to, we're not going to, we're just not going to take it anymore. And either you service at a reasonable cost or, We're going somewhere else. Well, Michael, in truth, I've devoted my entire life to trying to organize independent business. Mm -hmm. And you may be aware of a group I started in Vancouver working with all of the different end-of-life care community groups. It's called the Partners in Care Alliance Society. And that's what helped me win all of these battles with the billionaires in my city. But sadly, I just went on a tour of three funeral conventions talking to independents at each of these conventions about us standing up and trying to organize an independent business front for family funeral homes. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get any interest at all from my peers. 
because in each of their communities, those groups have been successful. So they don't see any need to organize against Wall Street. Whereas in my town, I'm the only one left. Um, we had to organize against Wall Street, but you know, if the consensus of my profession is nobody gives a hoot, well then we probably can't continue the Partners in Care Alliance either. I'm waiting to hear from the local hospices here whether they want to carry on with what we've been doing the last 30 years. Yeah. yeah the public here knows mm -hmm. the differences, that, but that's not the case in any other of the cities in North America. Generally, to me, the target cities are cities with more than a million people because that's where the cutoff is for big business to become anonymous yeah. in small towns everybody figures it out yeah so all right well um thank you for for joining us today tom and um and i hope everybody goes out it, you can find it on amazon um it it's your funeral uh, is the name of the book, and the official author is Thomas P. J. Crean. Is that correct? Yeah. So, um, and it's available on Amazon. Yeah. So go get your copy of the, of of the book, and it it actually it, uh, the the book itself from from what I've read so far it does kind of paint a picture of some of the reasons why. Um, the cost of, the cost of living is what it is right now, and how we can actually maybe put an end to it, and and win some some of our 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 hard earned dreams back again from from large corporations. So, again, Tom, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's been, been right. an honor to have you. Thank you, Michael. I I just want to really recommend to people that they take the time to check out the movie The Burial uh, being listed on Amazon, I think, on the 13th of October. Is that correct, Michael? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, and um, the, the film begs a very interesting question, and that is what is the power of the people? The people were able to exercise a, a punitive vote in the Mississippi courts um, that just it was the most blinding flash of democracy I've ever seen in my entire life but um, to me it was well earned so see Tommy Lee Jones and Jamie Foxx in the burial but uh, if you want to know some background check out my book all right all right thanks again Tom and thank you everybody thank for you, listening Michael. and we will see you next time um, uh, with another uh, uh, special interview here on Policy and Rights. Help us to
This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.